All right. Hello, everyone. It's Daishian Miller. We're here with uh, episode 103 of uh, Kuden. Uh, had some technical glitches before we signed on here, so we're a few minutes, uh, running a few minutes behind. Um, James is still having some glitches on his side. James, am I coming through okay? Yes? No? Awesome. Fantastic. Okay. So uh, episode 103. And uh, anyway, I got this postcard from uh, one of my students today, one of my long distance guys. Uh, he's an over-the-road truck driver, Daryl, and uh, just kind of filling me in. You know, he squeezes a lot onto uh, one little card. It reminds me of how my grandpa used to do things. Anyway, Daryl, that's not about age or anything, right? So, um, so what was really neat was that this really fit in with uh, what I wanted to be talking about tonight. So, um, Daryl's just kind of took some time off work, traveled to uh, Florida, visit family, that kind of thing, right? But uh, Wanted to let me know that um, after listening to the previous uh, uh, episode or video where I was talking about my student Joe uh, saving this woman's life, um, he's just hoping that he can get back in again for training, uh, uh, you know, other than or doing something, right, other than sitting uh, for hours a day uh, on my job. And again, he's an over-the-road truck driver, right? So it's not like he's like sitting around doing nothing, right? Um, still very active. Uh, <laughs> would put most people to shame when it comes to uh, like uh, fitness routines and kettlebells and all that kind of stuff that he does. Anyway, what he said was it's not exactly punching, kicking, uh, or getting thrown around uh, in a training hall, but I do practice things, right? Respect, Daryl. So Daryl, I, I know you do. Um, and this really played in with uh, what I want to be uh, discussing. Uh, and, 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 where people are in their heads about whether or not they can train, whether or not they can uh, they can study. So uh, what I wanted to cover was the the ninja two that I was introduced to, right? Uh, and there's some weird psychological kind of things that go on uh, info in in people's heads, right? With regards to training, uh, the official way that people get started, how to do it, quote unquote, right. For those of you listening on. Uh, uh, Stitcher Radio or Apple Tunes or Apple Podcast or whatever. I'm making these little air quotes, right? Um, but anyway, we'll talk about that when we come back. So let's go ahead and officially roll things out and get this episode started. So the big question is this. How are self-defense and success-minded people like us, concerned citizens worried about protecting ourselves, our loved ones, and the things we care about from the monsters we know exist in the world? How do we train in a way that gives us the skills, knowledge, and understanding we need without becoming paranoid fighters or killers ourselves, and yet still allows us to be the hero protector the world needs us to be? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Jeffrey Miller, and welcome to Kuden Radio, real training for real people in a real world. That was weird. James, are we still having a glitch? Was there no sound with that? With the intro? There was? Okay, huh, fair enough. All right. So, uh, well, we'll see what happens here. I, I don't know what's uh, what's going on with uh, me being able to hear sound. But anyway, um, oh, you know what? How about if I take that off for whatever reason? Hey, James, can you do a sound check now? Can you hear me? Nothing? Uh, nope. Going to have to turn that... <laughs> Turn that back on anyway. All right. So can you still hear me okay? I, I, I don't know what the heck is going on. I can't I can't hear James. Right? Apparently everybody can hear me. Anyway, all right. So we're back. All right. So here's this thing, right? Um I've been hearing this for years, right? Uh there's there's several different uh kind of comments, but they're pretty common, right? Uh and one of them is um whatever you're doing, whatever somebody's doing, right? That's not the way they do it in Japan, man. Um, and then I have to ask, where? Where in Japan? And when? Right? Because you have to remember that I started in this martial art 
1980, late 1980, early 1981. And um, I got to tell you, it's not done in Japan now the way it was then, right? So, and then that kind of falls into, you know, if you're not doing it this way, uh, you know, the current way, then you're not doing it the right way. And, uh, you know, that's old school and, and whatnot. So uh, pretty funny stuff. But here's this psychological thing, right? Um, share some uh, something about uh, our academy, right? We're, we're growing by leaps and bounds. As a matter of fact, we just um, just put uh, five more people on the on the uh, schedule to be coming in this week. And we've got another four, right, that still have to schedule. But either way, right? Uh, in the past, right, as a, as a kind of a, a recruitment kind of thing to get folks into our dojo, uh, we've done like membership drives, right, uh, and buddy days and things like that where students can, can sponsor, can, you know, kind of refer their friends or family or bring people in with them or whatever, right? And what we found is that sometimes that worked really well and other times it didn't work well at all. And it took me quite a while to try to figure out why. Right. And I'm sure people are trying to figure out what the hell this has to do with the ninja to I learned and all that. But this comes to, to mindset. Right. This is going to be a big theme, a big uh, a big part of, uh, of the upcoming spring camp that we're doing in May. Because, again, people can get attached to techniques and what things look like and, and all that. But they don't really understand what's going on in the background. And as as ninja practitioners, as practitioners of Budo, if you're overlooking the psychology, right, whether it's attacker psychology, your own emotional state, and those kind of things, uh, you're overlooking a huge part, right? And these are not my words. These are Hatsumi Sensei's and uh, these other master teachers, right? Um, you're looking overlooking a huge part uh, of the training. So anyway, back to this referral thing, right? It took me quite a while to kind of figure this out, but what I found doing some research and research into psychology and all that is that a student or parent or whatever, and, and, you know, you, you can look into other, other groups that you're a part of as well, but people tend to believe that you, again, I'm making air quotes for those of you listening to audio only that someone gets involved in the dojo the same way they did that person. Right. So if it's a me, you know, if I'm if I'm everyday Joe student in the dojo, I am more likely to believe that everybody gets involved the way I did. Regardless of the way they do or the way they did. Right. So when we had great responses during membership drives, what we found was that the people that that for the most part, the people that helped out in getting new students were actually products of referrals themselves. And during times that we didn't have a great turnout or a great response on membership drives, we found that the, the greater part of the student body got involved with the dojo uh, based on uh, phone calls or they contacted us through Facebook or whatever, right? So there was this preconceived notion that I don't need to help or I do need to help, right? Based on the way that or the, that group of students got involved themselves. Interesting, huh? In psychology, this is called transference, right? And what transference is, is the belief that other people are going to operate and process information and input and things like that the exact same way that I do, right? And so people will call whatever they're doing, common sense. And so as long as everybody else is doing that, right? Well, that's the way, right way to do it because that's, well, common sense, right? It's just, <laughs> why would you do it any other way, right? And they can't get their head wrapped around why somebody else is doing something differently, even though those people are getting positive results. They're, they're producing results. Um, they're not falling flat on their face, right? They're not ending up in jail. They're not dead whatever, right? They're feeding their families. Everything is going just fine, but it doesn't compute, right? Now, my Miko students understand that when we look at the mandala, right, we're looking at, you know, in, in one of the perspectives, right, there's 
five perspectives, five different mentalities or personality types on another model. There's nine, right? There's actually a whole lot more than that, but this, and, and then we, we move around the model to kind of look at different types of attacker psychology, right? Different ta- types of uh, defender psychology, but that in and of itself is based on uh, mood and perceptions and uh, fear or confidence and, and all these kind of things, right? And how you, you swap out a couple of variables and somebody's mood and state can change and how the mood and state actually creates the mindset, right? And and the options that are perceived. Now, what the hell does this have to do with Nijitsu? Well, the, in, the Nijitsu that I was introduced to and came up through for a long time is very, very different from what people are looking at today. As a matter of fact, um, I would I would agree with with most people who say that again here come those air quotes right that we're not studying nijutsu right anymore right we do budo taijutsu right we're not doing nijutsu right and I would agree with them okay except that the we that they're talking about doesn't include me doesn't include a whole bunch of folks that are training that started before a certain period because again. Just like with that membership membership drive, right? As people get involved in the art, whatever is going on at that time, however the training happens to be going on when they jumped on board, whatever that teacher's focus is during that period, right? That's what they're going to assume, right? They're going to assume that that's the right way, right? But folks like me, I got involved again, 80s. Some people even got involved before I did, right? 80s, 81, early 80s, right? We saw something very, very different in Japan from Hatsumi Setsai and the master teachers, uh, from you know the, the Western teachers that were trained by them as well, right? Very, very different than we saw in the late 80s, early 90s. That was different from what was going on in the late 90s, early aughts, right? Because things keep shifting, right? And there's lots of reasons for that happening. Everything between Hatsumi Sensei realizing at a certain point that people really didn't understand needed to. So we're going to take some time away. And what we're going to do is we're going to focus on Budo Taijutsu, Budo, the conventional martial skills, right? Because Nijutsu is a variation on those things, right? And it's damn near impossible to do a variation on something that you don't understand the basis for it anyway, right? Um, there was that going on. So we, we need to take time away. Uh, we're also going to make sure that, you know, we're doing things and, and things are going to shift and change because people are doing things in a way because they don't understand it or because they've got some kind of power trip going on or whatever. Uh, they're hurting themselves. They're hurting students. They're hurting other people. Uh, got to worry about, you know, legal things between international uh, law because people are coming to Japan on tourist visas, doing training, maybe getting hurt, whatever. So all kinds of reasons that things changed over time. A big reason was a lot of the masses came from other martial arts and didn't want to do all these other things within Nijutsu. You know, we don't, we don't need to do those things, right? So what ends up happening is Things change in the dojo, all that. And if you weren't in certain classes or at certain events or whatever, where these things were explained as to why the changes took place or whatever, you're not going to get those pieces of information, right? And as anybody that's ever been in law enforcement or investigations or anything knows, you miss one crucial piece of information and everything looks drastically different, right? So what I and a bunch of my peers saw were the changes that occurred, right? The reasons that they, that they happened. Sometimes the changes happened because the focus was on a different aspect of training. Sometimes things changed because those of us who were seniors were entering a new realm of training. And Hatsumi Sensei has always focused, well, at least as long as I've been involved, always focused on the highest level students that were moving on. So his classes 
whether they were in Japan or they were Taikai or Daikomusai, whatever, right? We're always focused on the senior students. And the lesson was always, if you're not at this level, you need to find a Shidoshi or a teacher who can explain the basics to you and help you get to a certain level where you'll, you will understand what I and the master teachers are explaining. Well, if you miss that, then everything else goes to hell in a handbasket, right? If you miss the fact that he did like three or four five-year cycles that took us through the Shu uh, uh formula, right? This traditional training formula um, through the training and then beyond that, right? Then that's not going to make sense either because the first five years, give or take, right? We were focusing on form. We were focusing on uh, very specific fundamentals, right? And every year, right, we did different things. Like one year, it was like short sword and spear. But if that's all you focused on, right? We did taijutsu and we did short sword and we did spear. But you didn't understand that we're focusing on the foundation, the fundamentals, right? Then all it's going to look like is what it looks like right? You're not going to, you're not going to get the pieces. And then the second phase that we went through, right, was in variation. And again, every year had its theme, but there was this grouping kind of theme, right? And then again, there was another set of five and you know, whatever, right? But w when I started out and for a, a good while, the focus, right, even when I started, right, we didn't call what we're doing, Bujinkan, right? It wasn't this, it wasn't this theme. It wasn't this thing, which is why so many people were confused when Hatsumi Sensei made all these people soke. I thought there was supposed to be a soke of the Bujinkan. Bujinkan was the name of his dojo, just like Takamatsu Sensei had a name for his dojo, right? It was the name of his dojo, which has grown into this big organization, but there's no lineage named Bujinkan. Right? Togakure, Shinden, Fudo, Togaki, uh, Kukushin, whatever. These are lineages. These are the, the, the each lineage gets a head. And I get it, right? Takama Sensei gave him these nine schools, made him soke these nine schools. But without having these little pieces of information, things are going to look different, right? But in the beginning, right? If you go back to any of these things, and I have all these magazine articles, books, all that stuff, right? Um, the way it was described was Togakure Ryu and eight other lesser known martial systems because they were all absorbed into and because they were all then given a ninja flavor because of the principles and concepts, right? Yes, I know there are these eight, eight nine lineages, whatever, you know, depending on how people, you know, figure things or whatever, right? There are these nine schools. But as they integrated with each other, right, and one person held them, it's not like cataloging, right? It's it's not the same, right? But what ended up happening was a lot of people didn't want to do certain aspects, right? A lot of people didn't want to do or didn't want to be involved in the philosophical kind of things, right? Because they were already heavily into uh, whatever their religious, you know, uh, affiliation was even though we weren't doing religion, right? Philosophy, religion, right? Again, depends on how you define things, but it's not the same, right? Are there aspects in each that could be? Yeah, of course, right? But it depends on your approach. But anyway, right? So what they were doing is chopping and hacking and, and all those kind of things, right? So, um, so people are dropping that stuff, right? But as people drop things off, They were still calling it Nijutsu. I'm doing Nijutsu. Really? Then why are you only doing, at best, one eighth of what is supposed to be Nijutsu? Right? Uh, a bunch of years ago, I don't even remember the year anymore, but uh, if you go to online ninjaacademy.com, one of the big programs that I have started out as a 10 week live, uh, it was an internet, live internet kind of thing, right? Walking people through this, this thing called the Ninja no Hachimon, right? Which was a litmus test in ancient Japan where 
if a school was not teaching at a minimum these eight areas, they could not identify themselves as a ninjutsu school, just like somebody who's supposed to be a practitioner of ninjutsu. There are these core eight, right? If you go to the Togakure school, right, there are these 18 levels of training. Actually, there's 36. But anyway, there are these 18 levels of training, right? But the core eight are still in there. There can be more. There cannot be less. That was the idea with the Ninja no Hachimon, right? But meanwhile, back at the dojo, back at Hombu, right, people are dropping these things, right? And so a lot of things got shifted at the dojo because of, again, safety reasons and all those kind of things, right? But again, meanwhile, back at my dojo, we're doing ninjutsu, right? Because these things are supposed to be in it. Now, are we always doing the traditional stuff or the classical stuff? I'm going to get to that traditional thing here in a minute, right? Uh, no, because one of the big things that people need to understand, especially those people who are supposed to be all about traditional, right? They need to understand that what was passed on was the technology of the day, right? Can you imagine, right? Um, you know, we've got fellow practitioners, right, in the Ukraine. We also have fellow practitioners in Russia as well. Um, but can you imagine being in a hot war zone like that and deciding, I don't need this modern stuff, right? I'm just going to do it the traditional way, right? So let me suit up with my sword and some throwing stars and maybe some blinding powder, and whatnot. And uh, that's how I'm going to go take on these guys with like fully automatic weapons and rocket launchers and, and stuff like that. Right. But that's what people are saying. Living in the 21st century, wherever they happen to live in the world. Right. Regardless of what the bad guys are carrying, regardless of the how the attacks happen in their area, they're going to do things classically. What? <laughs> Anyway, um, so, but that's what's happening, right? People are like bending and twisting and all that kind of stuff, right? So, but the ninjutsu that I was introduced to included everything from the, what was in the ninja no Hachimon to firearms training, knife defense, stealth, sentry takeout stuff, all that, right? And stuff that people don't want to talk about, right? Uh, uh, ESP. Uh, the things that would fall into that kind of category, uh, all that stuff, right? Because it's a part of the training, right? And I know people would argue like, you know, wilderness survival is not like, it's not listed anywhere. No shit. These people lived in the mountains, right? Do you write down how to breathe, right? If you were going to teach your kids something, would you write down how to breathe? Now you might, if you were doing special things like meditation or health things or whatever, but you don't write down the everyday obvious, right? Son, here's a key, right? If I'm late getting back and you get home from school before I do, let yourself in, get yourself a snack and start your homework, right? Your kid has watched you open a door with a key for how long? Did you have to cover which end? You probably, they probably got that when they were, before they entered preschool, right? generally how it, how it works, right? So you wouldn't write that stuff down. Well, there's a lot of stuff that wasn't written down, okay? There's also a lot of things that are conveyed teacher to student, right? That's called kuden, right? Void transmission. That's why the podcast is named what it is, right? But there are a lot of these things that were, that were presented and there were a lot of things that we did, right? Not just because the art was that way, but because the average student that came to the art was very, very different, right? Nine out of 10 people that came into the dojo already had lots of martial arts experience. They were specifically looking for ninjutsu. All of these things that could increase their advantage, but not just in a self-defense situation. Most of, were, most of us were attracted because of the psychology and all of this other stuff that was involved that most other martial arts didn't touch or were at best a side effect, like the confidence and the like what we call in my dojo, we call life mastery and life mastery skills. They're kind of these 
side effects, right? They're not the primary reason. And then the martial stuff is, is there to make sure that you can stay in the world so that you can do good in the world, right? People tend to have to run around, right? We do martial arts over here, and then we go over here and do meditation, and then we do go over here and we do some other spiritual study, and we go over here and we do yoga, and then we go over here and we do whatever, right? Um, so again, systematically, things were taken apart. But what we have now is a bunch of people that, um, a, a vast majority, right? that identify those of us who practice a certain way and do things the way it was introduced and the way it was passed on before all of these trimming away for the masses kind of things happened, right? Uh, there's this old school, right? This old school designation. Uh, and I think it, I mean, probably in a past episode, I've, I've, uh, I told this story, but I'm going to tell it again because I've got a bunch of new people now. Uh, one time I was, I was uh, training in Japan and, this, this old school thing kept coming around because the way the way things were explained way early on was you don't have to force a technique. If you have to force a technique, it's wrong. OK, so everything was about relaxed power and you don't have to try to hurt your partner because the techniques are designed to do that automatically. Right. If they work, that's it's kind of like you don't have to try to cut with a sword. Right. A sword cuts by its very nature. Okay. And yet people go out of their way to do like these little cutting motions and all that. When in reality, all you have to do when somebody's coming in is hold a blade so that the edge will be in the path that they're traveling on. Right. You don't have to go out of your way to cut. You just hold it there and they'll travel across it. Right. Same thing with all of your other techniques, Mushadori, Onikudaki, Seon, Tangeki, whatever. Right. Um, it's their very nature to hurt. So you use relaxed energy. That's why we train slowly for our partner's safety, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, but as time went on, the Japanese tried different, different phraseology, right? Uh, especially post-1998, right? During that uh, Taikai in Princeton, where Hatsumi Sensei made this shift, right? He said, for a while, we're going to put Nijitsu on the back burner, we're going to focus on Budo. We're going to focus on Budo Taijutsu, conventional samurai skills. And he gave all these reasons, right? Uh, but mostly it was because people were forcing things. They didn't understand it, uh, you know, and, and people were getting hurt, right? And the last thing we need are international incidents and all that kind of crap, right? He comes back, he comes to the United States or UK, whatever, does a seminar, somebody gets hurt, right? There's a, there's a, a foreign national involved, Right? There's all kinds of wild legal uh, kind of crap that goes on, right? So he made these shifts so that people could understand foundational things. Um, and then that turned into, well, we don't do Nijutsu, we do Budo Taijutsu. Those of us who had followed the timeline, we understand what we're doing, okay? We're taking time away from this specialty stuff to focus on this stuff. So when we bring this stuff back in, it has more power, right? But the idea with this relaxed training and, and all that, right? Body weight in motion, all those kind of things, right? A technique is designed to hurt because it freaking hurts. You don't have to try to make it hurt. If you have to try to make it hurt, your stuff sucks, right? So, but what ended up happening, again, because people get involved at certain periods and things are being described a certain way, certain understandings happen. Right. And one of those understandings was about this thing called soft training. Right. So soft training from our perspective became there's no power in your technique at all. There's no. Uh, and that's what we said. They would, uh, and you can find recordings right on YouTube and all that. of some of this training with a translator, you know, pops this thing out. And that's what we said. They stops people training and says your technique has no bite. Because everybody was so wrapped up in soft training and not hurting their partner. Hurting your partner and causing pain are two completely different things. Right? In training, getting hit and getting hurt are two completely different things. But without the understanding of those things and by stepping in and stripping away certain things, everybody's now doing what they think they should be doing, but what they've really done is 
retranslated the art. Okay. And so now what we have is a bunch of people running around with this so-called soft training who are enjoying themselves, not taking anything away from that, right? But what they're doing is they're calling old school practitioners, right? Uh, they're identifying them, right? Because any any technique that hurts, right? They'll they'll stop you and go, no power, no power, right? It's not supposed to hurt your partner. You're not damaged. Okay, let's not confuse the two, right? But what they're then identifying, they're, they're, they're talking about is that if you cause pain, right? If a technique causes pain or it surprises someone or causes some kind of, you know, response that it's supposed to cause, even though you're moving slowly and you, but, but your positioning is right, your your uh, your uh, alignment and all that, you, you've got precision going on, your timing is right, your rhythm is right, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, if it causes pain, then it's it's old school, right? That's that's a that's a power stuff that everybody did. No, it's supposed to be relaxed power, okay? But it's become a slight, right? Um, and it's become a misinterpretation. So anyway, uh, I'm I'm at a dojo. Um, Isuka says he's dojo, as a matter of fact. And a lot of the stuff had been going on, right? That I, I kept running into this, right? I'm doing everything relaxed and whatever and people are getting tweaked and oh, no power no power you're old school and, and they would you know trade off and go get somebody else or whatever not forcing anything nothing is going on right so anyway i'm in east sensei's dojo and uh we're having this little sidebar conversation during a break in training and uh, he had mentioned a couple of things during class and in his dojo you're going to feel pain as a matter of fact you're going to feel pain to the point where you're thinking maybe something's going to break, right? But all, all the movement is is what it's supposed to be, relaxed, and but it's about the timing, the angling, the flow, that kind of thing, right? People are they're, they're trapped and you're caught off guard and you need break falls, right? Your ukemi has to be good. Not just falling down ukemi, your ability to receive a technique. Ukemi means receiving body. It doesn't mean break falls. Okay. So there's another mistranslated bullshit, right? Are break falls a part of ukemi? Yes. Is it everything about ukemi? No. It's kind of like our training drills, senundo and inundo. Uh, one having to do with moving from kamai to kamai and not losing the benefits of kamai in the process. You don't open up holes while you're moving around. And the other one that has to do with defense to offense transition and uh, offense to defense transition, right? This, this unbroken flow kind of thing. When I introduce these things to students, I say, look, these things are, these things in and of themselves are not self-defense techniques, but they have everything to do with self-defense. They're not kata. They're training drills. Okay. Don't look at them like kata. James, just by a, a thumb or a nod, how many times do people confuse them with kata? Right? Yes, he's he's laughing. Right. So he's, he's muted out at the moment, but um, it's 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 amazing. Right. So um, and we have to be careful with this. Right. I just had did a full class uh, this this past week, uh, not this week, but last week uh, with my platinum guys, my inner circle uh, students. Uh, that was their personal development week. Okay, So our, our lesson plan for the month is divided. Each week is a different theme. So uh, my Tuesday group and my Friday group, while they may not have the same class topics as my, I have different tiers in my, in my distance training program. Um, so if, if they're in one group or the other group, they may not get the same class. If they're in the top tier group, they're getting both classes anyway. So it doesn't matter. I just don't want to bore my top tier guys. But anyway, um, one of the things that we discussed was in how we define something, right? However you define something, it's a trap right? Because that's now your perception and you will process everything else based on that definition, right? Which is why the trap for a lot of folks now who are trying to be all inclusive, right? Ego can't broaden that far, right? What, what they're trying to do is lose reference points, right? 
And I get the idea of being accepting to as many people as possible. I get that, right? But I can accept any person for who and what they are and still not let them into my realm and, and sphere of influence, right? And you can call me all kinds of names that, that, that come up for you that make you feel good about yourself. But um, there's people that I know in my life, and some are family members, that are absolutely neurotic and destructive. I love them and I accept them for who they are but they may not trample through my life. It's just not allowed, right? And people need to, to, to understand that you can, be, you can be accepting of all people. I was having a discussion with a student today about hating. I said, if I hate somebody, I'm already taking action that is not going to be pleasant, right? But I don't, right? 99.9999% of the world, even if somebody's like evil, right? I have a difficult time hating, right? But that doesn't mean the opposite. So a lot of people, they can't break out of dualistic thinking. Well, if I don't hate them, then I must love them or at the very least accept them. Well, I do, okay? I'm a very, very accepting person. I accept everyone for who and what they are. I can learn from them. Some of those lessons are going to be negative lessons, I'm going to have to reverse engineer them to produce the kind of results that I want to get out of the world, right? But um, because I accept someone doesn't mean that I have to allow them to trample through my life. It's just, it's not the same, right? But again, people get caught up with this stuff. But anyway, back to Ishizuka Sensei's dojo. Sorry, I took a little squirrel hole. Sorry about that. All right. So anyway, I'm back in, back in his dojo and we're talking about this stuff. And I said, you know, I I'm, I'm, I'm having a, I'm having a difficult time finding training partners. And it's, I mean, I'm in a room with dozens, if not oh, well over a hundred people. Right. Um, uh, and it's not because of the, the number, right. I said, I, I, I keep being identified as old school. And he says, he looks at me kind of quizzically and he goes old school. What, what is old school? And I, I told him, I said, you know, if I make a technique hurt, um, I'm, I'm called old school. And then I, I qualified it. I said, you know, I, I've been around since like at early 80s, 1980, 81. Um, and what I was taught was techniques should be this, relaxed effort and all that. Techniques will hurt by their very nature, right? Um, but people are equating pain with force. And they're not being able to differentiate. I said, but but what they're what they're doing is it's become a slight, it's become an insult, right? That if you cause pain in any way, then you're using force, and that's old school, and that's wrong. And he said, really? Hmm. Well, then I'm old school too. And he just kind of laughed it off, and I laughed, and whatever. But there, there's this again misunderstanding, right? So um, I just own it. Right. If, if that's if old school, if doing what I was taught and producing the results that we're supposed to be producing, insult or not, it, you know, is, is producing this kind of thing, then I just have to have you know, the broad shoulders that I have, even without the resistance. It doesn't have shoulder pads. Right. So I do have broad shoulders. So anyway, um, for those of you who are just listening uh, or listening audio wise, you have no idea. I was just patting a blazer and <laughs> whatever. Anyway, so um, so again, there are these misunderstandings, right? The ninjutsu that I was that I was introduced to included a huge area. Now, some were modified, right? Of the of the Togakure's eighteen, uh, because not everybody has access to horses and bajutsu, right? Uh, horsemanship uh, is included, but that was also primary means of transportation other than fucking walking, right? So there's that. Um, and when you, speaking of walking, right? When you're looking at the ninja oruki, right? Ninja walking methods, right? Where is normal everyday walking on the list? It's not. James, have you seen it on the list? Look, we have Kaniyuki for Kotoryu or Yokoruki, right? We have Koashi small step. We have Nukiashi sweeping step. Uh, all these things, right? We have these, there's like seven different types of steps. Most of them come from, from the 
Gyokushin Ryu, right? Uh, from the stealth stuff. But where is the everyday walking stuff? Because Hatsumi Sensei, as a matter of fact, just popping up popped in, the, in my head during that 98 Taikai that I was talking about, where he made that switch and just told everybody, look, Bujikan for a while is going to be focusing on these samurai basics, right? Um, he called up a couple of uh, female uh, Japanese students um, who were doing uh, certain types of Japanese dance that were in kimono and geta, the, the wooden sandals, um, and a couple of other folks that were doing things. As a matter of fact, Tatsumi Sensei and his wife uh, have been or were involved in traditional Japanese dance with and without geta for a long time, and he would always make these references, right? Um, but he called these people up so that he could show that 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 walking was a part of ninja walking, everyday walking. One of the first lessons I got, and therefore my students, my long distance students, uh, one of the first video lessons they get is in ninja walking, right? And I don't mean stealth, even though it's the same, right? I mean everyday walking so that you lose the sway, the bounce, the swagger, the lean, the pitch, the bob, whatever, right? Um that was that was a huge part of the the lesson because if you can't control the way you stand, shift, move your legs, walk or whatever, you're never going to master taijutsu, no matter how whatever you believe that you're you're got to look like, right? Um, because it all goes back to walking, right? Yokoruki, same thing, right? Yokoruki is nothing but normal walking, but done with one foot doing it doing the same thing. Instead of heel to toe, it's doing it from outside edge to inside edge, right? And you're transitioning between Ichimonji and Hicho with both legs as you transition, as you move along, which is why sometimes they called it Ichimonji walking, right? Um, but these were all foundational lessons, but you don't find them anywhere in the friggin' scrolls. Why not? Because everybody learned to walk that way um, that walked in Japanese geta. And if you'd never walked in Geta, then you had to learn it as a kid. First time they were put on, because if you don't walk correctly, you'll trip yourself and fall on your face, which was probably funny to the kids. But eventually people pick it up. Right. So there's a lot of things in the art that we Westerners need to friggin learn. OK. Another one of those things is basic Japanese etiquette. Right. Uh, bunch of years ago, there was a, there was a class before Hatsumi Sensei showed up for class because somebody pissed him off. And you don't often see that because he's all smiles and throwing out rank. And then somebody comes in afterwards, right? So everybody's all proud about the rank. But what most people don't see is the guy that comes in afterwards toward the end of class and goes, well, let me get your information. Okay. Next class, bring your 30,000 yen uh, to pay for the rank you just got. Right. So it's cool. Right. But anyway, um, there are all these, all these prerequisite lessons that for those people who are supposedly traditional, supposedly classical or whatever are missing because they're only looking at what's actually written in the scrolls. What's written in the scrolls? Shorthand. Okay. James, do you have, does anybody on, uh, and James will have to watch the, the comments and all that. Does anybody have one of those kits that you can get? Um, you go to antique places or you go to uh, uh, sometimes Asian places or whatever. You can order the things online. There are these little kits that have like the, the show brushes and the um, uh, different things for doing calligraphy, doing uh, kanji, right? Uh, James, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. Usually, usually a little container, a uh, little uh, thing of dragon's blood. Right. And sometimes they have like a honko. You have to carve your own. Right. Um, but they have this little uh, soapstone kind of thing. Right. That you make your little uh, honko with. Uh, in Chinese, they call it a chop. But um, you have these different things. Then you have this little uh, little bowl and what looks like kind of a oddly shaped ashtray that some kid tried to make in pottery class. And Right. Um, it, everything turned into an ashtray. Right. But it's kind of slanted and all that. And it's shallow on one end and deep on the other. And, uh, you know, like an unfilled swimming pool or something like that. Right. And there's a little spoon uh, kind of thing and um, these little empty dishes. Right. Um, and then there's this black 
stick that has like a sometimes it, it's just plain and other times it has this gold uh dragon or some other design on it right well it's a soot stick okay and those implements in there are for you to make your own ink right so there's one container that you would have water in and then that little spoon is to just keep the the, the uh, stone wet don't put too much in there because it'll just be watered down and you'll be grinding that soot stick down for a long time to get the right consistency. But anyway, and then when, as you make it, you pour that into another one, right? So that you have this stuff, right? Um, we cheat these days. We go to the uh, to the uh, stationery store or whatever and get these little bottles of it, psh, squirt it in. Even when Hatsumi Sensei is doing everybody's uh, scrolls, right? That mm, They get uh, pre, pre-made ink. But anyway, that stuff's in there, right? Now, let's go back a couple of decades, centuries, or whatever, right? Paper is really, really freaking expensive because it's only made by craftsmen. Okay. It's really expensive. You also didn't go to Walmart or whatever your favorite department store is or stationery store or Home Depot or uh, Office Depot, I guess, right? Um, or Staples or whatever and buy reams of paper. So if you made a mistake, toss that in the trash can and start again, right? Stuff's <laughs> not cheap, right? And then on top of that, you're making your own ink. Okay. They're not writing stuff out in great detail. It's supposed to be a reminder for those who were introduced to things. Okay. So they're not writing down everything. This Kuden idea is where students got a lot of this stuff, right? Uh, I think I told people before about this uh, time that I spent um, in Toronto, right? Uh, one of the uh, Master teachers had come over, somebody had taken me under his wing a long, long time ago. And my friend called and said, Hey, he was up, you know, visiting, just coming up for a friendly visit. Uh, <laughs> I don't drive and I don't want to have to take all the extra time taking him around on public transportation. You have a car, you drive, you train. Hey, and you're single at the moment. Uh, would you come up and uh, help drive him around? Let's see, a week from sun up to sundown or whatever was needed to be with a master teacher for a week. Hmm. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'll do it. Right. <laughs> yeah, it didn't take that long. Right. So anyway, I'm up there and that was one of the most painful weeks of my life. And most of the training that was done that entire week was him covering ninja walking. Anytime I parked the car and we went anywhere on foot, he was that consciousness in my ear. Jeff son, good ninja walking idea. I think so. So he demonstrated it once or twice. And then every time my walking changed or it broke from the form, there was that voice. Jeff son, wait, district, wait, wait, move timing with knees, you know, ankles. Good ninja walking idea. I think so. Yeah. Fucking A, this hurt, right? I mean, I long past the ego thing of <laughs> which this guy would, maybe I should just go back home, except that my legs were already well sore. And then there came the lessons because we had to do steps instead of elevators and those kind of things. So here's how you do steps up and down and that kind of thing. And you just do it until it doesn't hurt anymore because the muscles get trained. Well, Sensei, where is this on the scrolls? Not on scrolls. Good ninja walking idea, right? <laughs> okay, it's inks at a premium. You know, okay? there were no videos, there were no books, there were no well, there were books, but people were handwriting the books to give them to somebody else, just like Takuma Sensei handwriting the books that he gave to Hatsumi Sensei to pass on lessons so that Hatsumi Sensei could study them in the week or two between one visit and the next because he had to travel by train halfway across Honshu Island to train with Takuma Sensei. Hatsumi Sensei lived in Noda City, right? A suburb of Tokyo. Takuma Sensei lived near um, uh, Kyoto and Nara in that region, right? Uh, anybody that ever goes to Japan with me on one of the trips knows that that's a two and a half to three hour Shinkansen bullet train ride at high speeds. 
uh, not local or semi-local train uh, the Hudson since they took, right? So, and, and that now leads kind of into traditional, right? What the hell is traditional, right? People want traditional. I mentioned this in the past, right? Classical, traditional, right? So really a couple of, a couple of really good um, YouTube videos uh, made by some historians and people that did a lot of research, right? Uh, like things about the samurai that you probably don't want to know kind of thing, right? Um, I highly recommend that if you're if you're all caught up in traditional and classical, check those out, okay? Because um, I look at people and go, just how traditional do you want to be there, modern samurai bubba, okay? As in like um, sex with young boys, is that cool with you? Is that okay? Okay. Uh, there's all kinds of things, right? Just people have their fantasies to live by. Okay. Anyway. So, but this traditional, right? Sometimes the traditional tradition that people are referencing started with Takamatsu Sensei. Sometimes that traditional started with Toda or Mizuda or um, uh, Ishitani, one of Takamatsu Sensei's uh, three teachers. Sometimes it goes way far back, sometimes not. Okay. And here's something that I was taught very, very, very early on. The most traditional thing that I can do as a practitioner of the art of ninjutsu is not be running around in hakama, a dogi, uh, training with a samurai sword and throwing ninja stars. Now, that was just a statement, but it broadens out into all of these historical museum kind of things. The point is where the samurai attached everything to tradition, right? And yes, the ninja have their tradition, but it's not the same, right? Everything fixed and stagnated because if it was good enough for great, 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 great grandpa, then it was good enough for his kid and his kid and you know whatever right so tradition stays right the ninja were a counterculture because they were open to anything that it could allow me to be more successful and quicker let's go okay so when the samurai decided to ditch firearms after they had imported them right uh the the long gun right the, uh, that they called the tanagashima right it's called tanagashima not because that has any meaning for firearm or whatever. Um, it was named because it was imported through the port of Tanagashima uh, by the Port Portuguese, I think. Right. Um, so once the samurai realized that untrained people that they recruited for war, going through the villages to get to amass an army to, to load it up and everything to go, how they could erase a trained samurai who had developed all these skills by nothing but pulling a trigger, right? Um, they got rid of them because it wasn't honorable. And the ninja went, screw that. <laughs> this is awesome, right? Because um, it will improve or increase advantage, right? Um, of course, then you start, you know, with mudslinging, like these people are dishonorable and whatever, right? So, um, but we have to be careful with that, right? Because what that what that lesson that I was taught was was that to be a ninja is to always be looking for what will help me produce the same or better results, and what's what's going on. And actually, the samurai did it too, right? So we have the the ninja juhake, right? The eighteen levels of the of ninja training in the Togakure school. Again, actually thirty six, because eighteen the other eighteen were the conventional Budo skills. But if you look at the charts and you'd have to do some historical study or look into the, the Genbukan that Tanamura Sensei uh, founded when he broke away from the booth from the Bujinkan, right? He has his stuff listed at different eras. Even the, the, um, the uh, Buge Juhapan, right? The, the samurais uh, 18 levels of training, right? That, that changed over time because certain weapons came into favor, other ones went out, 
uh, the, the dachi gave way to the katana, armor changed, all that kind of stuff. So what was what was conventional and what was uh, what was mainstream was different, right? Uh, people that are looking at traditional things, right? They a lot of them would be hard pressed, right? If I said you need to call this stuff karate, because at certain points in our tradition, in our tradition, right, what we're doing was called karate because that was the term of the time, the, the fashionable term of the day, right? People say taijutsu, budo taijutsu, nimpo taijutsu. We're talking about the unarmed stuff. But that's no different than karate, right? I don't care what your perceptions of karate are. What's the translation of the word karate? Empty hand, unarmed, okay? People tend to uh, attach karate to, well, that's what the gojudo guys do and the shotokan guys do. And, uh, karate is karate. Right. It's just a term to reference unarmed. But again, people get their freaking willies in a, in a jam um, because they they get fixated on things. Right. So but again, what's traditional? Right. Traditional for samurai is you don't freaking change it. Right. That's why in the do limit lineages, karate do, judo, aikido. Right. You don't change anything. The grandmaster is like a museum curator. Their job is to make sure things get preserved, right? The stuff that we have, every grandmaster adds to things, right? And adjust it with the time, okay? Uh, first time I ever learned that things got adjusted with the time was when I was learning Kosei no Kata or Kosei no Kamai, okay? Kosei, it's one of the Kukishinden uh, Kamai, right? And what I was taught was, Here's the way we're doing it today. Here's the way most people have been, you know, uh, introduced to it, right? Here's this kosei, right? But it didn't always look that way, right? There's a form of kosei that predates that one that looks like one of the karate uh, dachi stances. Hand inverted, on hip, front arm out, almost like a bobi no kamai uh, with a slight modification, Right? Because of the weight and the way the armor was built, you had to move a certain way to help throw, sling that arm uh, out into the fight, right? Uh, one year in Japan, we focused on um, uh, fighting tactics uh, from the Kamakura era, okay? The armor was very different, right? The dachi, this, what, what most people identify as a ginormous katana, right? Not the same, okay? I don't care what it looks like, not the same. Metallurgy was different. They didn't understand the same, right? It didn't. It wasn't as sharp as a katana, right? The armor during the time, right? Woven grass, lacquered wood, that kind of stuff, right? Well, a katana would cut right through that, right? Absolutely. But a dachi did not. Armor had to change when the weapons changed. But that entire year, we focused on fighting based on Kamakura era tactics, right? It's the history, okay? So do I want to still be defending? I mean, you know, again, right? The armor is based on the weapons, okay? Does that mean if we're going to go help our friends in the Ukraine or we're going to go, uh, you know, uh, be on a SWAT team or on a military team or whatever, right? We're going to dress up in samurai armor or worse yet, the ninja's armor, right? Um, and go up against uh, automatic uh, weapons or grenades or whatever. It's ludicrous, right? So tradition, traditional, is understanding what it is <laughs> that makes the art what it is and then allowing it to shift with the time, okay? I mentioned earlier, if you go to uh, onlineninjaacademy.com, again, shameless plug, what do you think, James? Okay, so go there and you uh, uh, jump into the uh, Ninja no Hachimon, right? It 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 it's just it was this ten week course originally. Now it's ten modules, right? Takes you to, through each of the eight gates, but we also have these discussions about what each of these gates would look like today, right? Um, I don't I don't think the the page is ready yet. Is it James with the with a new worksheet that I just did? I know I gave it to to inner circle guys, but I don't think we have that set up yet with a squeeze page, right? 
where I, I refashioned that because I, I one of the worksheets I have is just laying out the Nijin no Hachimon and there's a brief description on it and a link to uh, related uh, programs that I have. But uh, I just recently made up one where it has the the classical eight gates, right? And what what that would look like in today's world, right? On the other side, right? Because what you have to understand is the the essence, right? Why is that on the list? Why is that important, right? Why in the ninja's eight gates is spear and and uh, halberd there, soljutsu, right? But not longstaff. Shit, why is Longstaff typically not a part of even the buge juhapan, right? The classical warriors kind of thing. Well, you'd have to understand history and understand that that was the walking stick of the day. It was also the pole that you throw across your shoulders to carry buckets of water from the river or the well or whatever, right? Everybody, right? Because they had to, they had to fend off, uh, you know, wild monkeys if they lived in the mountains or whatever, or, um, uh, poisonous snakes or whatever, right? Everybody was pretty freaking decent with a with a long staff, right? So, but if I see that on the list, I'm not just going to limit my training to spear and halberd because spear and halberd are combination weapons that combine staff and sword, long sword and short sword. So it's a combination weapon, which means I already have to know those other things before I do these things. Right, ninja no ken, ninja's use of uh, of the sword. Right, not just the ninja's sword, short sword, but a ninja also need to have, know how to use a katana, a wakazashi, or shoto, depending on the term that was that was conventional for the time. Right, she sees different things. Right, um, you know, people talk about tanto, you know, knives. Right, that was not the length. What most people know was a tanto today was not the length of a blade back in the day. The knife of the day was the Shoto or the Wakazashi, right? Tanto was for very specific kind of things, like, oh, I don't know, committing seppuku, harakiri, right? It's just, again, we have to be careful with this stuff, right? So anyway, the ninjutsu that I was exposed to, the ninjutsu that I'm passing on, right, um, is not some part of it. It's not just... Budo Taijutsu with some weapons thrown in and a couple of discussions here or there. Oh, the ninja would do this or the ninja would do that or whatever. Okay. Um, do the students have to, you know, uh, do they have to do both sides? Yeah. All my students going through uh, James and all my local guys know that in the, our adult program at the school, right? Um, is the the what we we call our, our mastery leadership program, right? It's for people that want to get at least a first degree black belt, right? It's budo slash ninpo taijutsu because they have to understand the fundamentals. Okay, my shinobi kai traditional ninja training group, right? Um, that springboards off of that into ninjutsu. Those are the guys that are doing stealth. Those are the guys that are doing um, uh, bodyguard work and and. Uh, uh, what else? Wilderness survival training and all that. I mean, those seminars are open to other people, but um, it's it's not the same. Okay, it's not. Hmm. That's that's going to sound different to people because they're going to th again. People take whatever they define things as, right, and then they trap themselves because if it's not this, then it must be this. Really, why can't it be both? It's kind of like in our mikyo, right? Um, in in uh, Buddhism, there's this uh, there's this concept of a yana, yana yana means vehicle, right? So there's three vehicles, right? Three general types of Buddhist uh, practice, right? There's what's typically known as the Hinayana, traditionally classically called the Theravada, right? It's called the elders, right? The term Hinayana didn't come into being until a second reformation, right? Kind of like the uh, Judaism being reformed and becoming Christianity and that being reformed and becoming Islam. Not, I didn't make that up. Okay. History. Right. So uh, the, the second reformation, which produced things like Zen and pure land and, and things like that was known as the Mahayana. Mahayana means greater vehicle. 
Okay, great vehicle, big vehicle, that kind of thing. Maha means big or great. So the Mahayana people started calling the Theravadins, right? Hinayana. Okay, Hinayana. It's not a slight, right? The the Theravada people hate that term Hinayana because they mistranslate it, right? Hinayana means lesser vehicle. Now, it does not, these things have nothing to do with like, oh, you guys are doing the tiny vehicle. We're doing the big vehicle. It had to do with the Reformation had to do with how do we, how do we expand this so that more people can get involved? Because the classical, the Theravadan way was you had to be single, unmarried, whatever, had the ability to wander off into the freaking forest or the mountains to practice. And so the Mahayana people called that the lesser vehicle because less people could get involved, right? During a time in history where there was no, uh, there was no birth control, there was none of this stuff, right? So if you got together with somebody, got married and had kids, you now had a job, responsibilities, all that kind of stuff, right? There wasn't like this modern Western thing where you can take on and drop spouses uh, because you got an itch in your ass or whatever, right? You, you know, the, the culture was one, one spouse and you're, you know, you're hooked. And then once you started having kids, um, you know, you, you've got these responsibilities, right? So lesser vehicle, Mahayana, greater vehicle, because it was modified so that more people could practice. They couldn't practice the way the Hinayana people practiced, but they could get some kind of benefit. And then there was this third reformation, right, where there was this Vajrayana, the diamond thunderbolt vehicle, right, which went back to the original base within Hinduism, uh, the Upanishads and the, the, uh, the, the uh, Vedas, which was this esoteric stuff to bring things back in um, to kind of go full circle. Less people can actually do that as well. Um, and the aptitude has to be greater. And this is not about knocking anybody or whatever, but what this actually did was produce three different paths to the same place. And then based on what you were able to do, what you were attracted to, drawn to, what you gained benefit from, whatever, you, you, could, you could do that thing, right? But see, here's the way it works, right? The, the folks doing Hinayana, right, the classical stuff, when they look at what Mahayana and Vajrayana people are doing, they will look at you and go, that's not real Buddhism. That's not the real thing. Okay. It's not, it's not, it's not right. Okay. This is what's right. Okay. Mahayana people know that their stuff is based on the Hinayana stuff. And so I, I can't do this without having a foundation in Hinayana. I have to understand that to be able to, to do the expansion stuff. So to them, of course, this is Buddhism, that's Buddhism, but they'll look at Vajrayana and go, mm, but that's not, that's not Buddhism, okay? People in the Vajrayana know that you start with the Hinayana understanding stuff, you expand on things in the Mahayana, and then you concentrate things for faster results using these techniques. So to them, you can't have Vajrayana without Mahayana and Hinayana. To the Mahayana, you can't have Mahayana without Hinayana. To the Hinayana, that's all you have, okay? But the same thing goes on in our martial training as well, okay? You can't have Nidutsu without the conventional Budo. But you got this weird shit going on, okay? Each one is a stepping, is, is a step, right? Or a rung in the ladder toward this stuff, right? So um, you got to be careful. We really, really, really have to be careful. And, and, and it, it all starts with how we define things or how we were taught to define things, right? It's just like people today getting their news by scrolling as fast as they can down their phone or tablet and only reading headlines, never stopping to actually read the article. And if they do, well, they read a you know, paragraph or two. Or what a lot of people do is they get the news the same way they got the lessons in school. They see this headline, they formulate this thing, but see, they don't want to, they don't get stuck because they know that fake news is out there. So what they do is they send a message out to a bunch of their friends or post something online 
and they ask what everybody else thinks. So now you're going to get your knowledge based on everybody else's, hopefully not misguided information, right? It's the same thing, right? It's a trap and we have to be careful, right? So please don't take this the wrong way. I'm not ringing my bell. But the ninjutsu that I was introduced to was way fucking harder than the ninjutsu that everybody else thinks that they're doing. There was more stuff. We were told flat out, it's going to take you longer to master this. Right? And there is no shortcut. So, right? Just It's just like, you know, if I, if I were only going to do things traditionally, then I would just, I would have stopped at the seven types of footwork for stealth because that's what's in the scrolls. That's what's there. Here, here you go. Do this. Except that in today's world, a modern ninja has to have a higher degree of skill in stealth than one of our spiritual ancestors a couple of centuries ago, a couple hundred years ago. Why is that? Well, shit, they didn't have to worry about infrared, motion detectors, anything like that, bionic ears. They didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. They had the nose and ears of dogs, and they had the eyes and ears of human beings. And they had to be cautious of uh, animals and insects, okay? Because birds fly away from commotion. They also fly away from uh, populated areas, okay? But once they're startled, right? Insects stop chirping, right? When disturbed. Uh, that kind of stuff, right? So this is the stuff that's in the Bonsan Chukai. This is the stuff that's in the Shoninki, okay? It's important to know if you're ever out in the middle of freaking nowhere and being, pers and being pursued, okay? But what about moving your, around your own property, trying to avoid somebody or sneak up on them or whatever, right? And you have a motion sensor to the, to the driveway light or the, the light over your garage or whatever, right? Uh, have you tried to sneak past that, right? All that stuff, right? And so here we are, right? Having discussions like this. Okay, anyway. Um, and again, there's there's plenty to pick and choose from, right? And going, going back to Daryl's postcard, because I just looked over here, I almost forgot that I was going to mention this, right? Uh, Daryl's postcard, right? Um, yeah, Daryl's, as he says, right? sitting on the job, right? Because he's in a truck. But he finds time to do what he can do. He doesn't have the time to get to a dojo, right? It doesn't have the time. I mean, every once in a while, he makes it in for one of our seminars. But he finds things to do. And anyone who earnestly, honestly wants to train will find things to do, even if they're just focused on Budo Tadzutsu. They'll find things, even if it's just stretching. Even if it's just squats, even if it's just come on Sanji brackets. Okay. But again, what they do and how long they do it is all going to be based on what they perceive. Right. You think you're an expert? Guess what? You're going to stop. Okay. Because you already think you got it. You already think you know everything. Okay. Um, it, it, you know, if you think that it's limited to this or this, right, then that's that's it, right? Uh, if you haven't been introduced properly to like the Kyonopo principle, right? Which I'm going to be covering. Is that this whiteboard Wednesday? I think so, right? Um, if you haven't been introduced to that, then then the Kyonopo is the Kyonopan, right? It's eight things, right? It's eight models. And then as soon as you think you have that, then you're done, right? Because, oh, God, if I have to do that one more time, I'm going to scream. Well, then start screaming because we're not done with it. Okay, same thing with the Sanchin. People talk a good show, but based on what they do and how they act, the understanding is not there. Okay, I would rather have students that have less than perfect taijutsu or less than perfect skill sets that are constantly working on things, but they understand the mindset and the framework and they're working on it and they know how much time it's going to take, right? That somebody rushes to a decision, thinks that this is 
you know, this is all there is, right? Drive up to the drive up window, order uh, Koto Shoden, no Maki, and uh, get my, what, 18 kata, 17 kata, something like that, right? And uh, go home and practice and, and, and get those to where I can impress people on camera and post my videos and uh, set myself up as a uh, Joe Cool Guru. Or as some people online who mispronounce things all the time, it's not guru, it's guru or uh, I don't know, whatever. Grand Poobah. Anyway. All right, James, it's that time of the the uh, the show. Do we have any... Uh, you might have to send things through on chat or whatever. How, how's your how's your audio? Are you through? Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's me. You know what? I'm gonna fire you up. Let's see. Let's see if we make things. Oh, <laughs> he hit the button same time I did. All right. So is your audio working? Nope. <laughs> Everybody read James' lips, which is really funny because James doesn't. His mouth doesn't move all over the place. He, he, you'd be a good natural-born Japanese speaker or a ventriloquist. <laughs> anyway, all right. So um, who's on? I, I I don't bring chat up anymore because the last the first couple of times we did that, assholes hijacked the freaking uh, feed and then put on all kinds of crap. So um, we, we filter stuff now. Let's see if we get filtered or blocked because I said asshole. Or how many times do you have to say asshole before the assholes who are in charge block you for saying asshole? Anyway, I'm not politically correct either. I did see something. Uh, Jimmy had posted a comment. Maybe it was just hide, hi or something. I saw that slide through. All right. James is looking. All right. Don't forget all the stuff is up for uh, spring camp, May 13th, 14th, and 15th, right? Getting your head on straight. We're going to be covering um, these different mental aspects. Uh, what you, what, what I say, what you should be, but what you could be, because I don't want to trigger anybody. I do that enough, right? Now, once you become my student, <laughs> I will trigger you. Um, because I we we need to handle your buttons. We need to make sure that those buttons uh, are not an issue, right? Otherwise, all you're doing is hiding from people that might push your buttons, and then if you encounter them, it's just going to shut you down the same way it, uh, it it would every day, right? But anyway, um, things that you should be doing in your head uh, at certain ranges, right? Uh, mistakes that people make. Uh, mentality wise, right? While they're doing a technique at the end of a technique, uh, how long to hold a certain mindset after you've done the takedown, uh, those kind of things, um, all kinds of stuff. We're going to be, we're going to be, uh, diving into the mandala, uh, and, and taking a look at, um, uh, we're gonna be taking a look at, at, uh, uh, parts of the Bushido, not necessarily the code, cause it was an unwritten thing until, was it the the early 1900s? A uh, Japanese author had had compiled these things, right? Uh, seven or eight uh, different uh, personality traits, which really have to do with mindset and responsibility and, and those kind of things of a warrior. So not all ninjutsu. I mean, ninjutsu is based on the samurai stuff, and it, sometimes even the and the word ninja is a, is a fairly modern word, right? But sometimes the ninja were identified as the samurai from Iga or the samurai from Koga. Right? Because samurai, one who serves, right? That's the translation, comes from the from the Japanese verb samurao, which means to serve. Right. So if you were in service of someone, and again, samurai, the, the term meant different things at different points. Again, that's why I'm always suspect of somebody who goes, I want to do it traditionally, I want to do it classically. Pick an era, Bubba. Okay. We need to def we need to talk about things in, in specific places. Right. So um but anyway, uh, mentality, the, the mindset stuff is, is going to be a huge part of that. Uh, fall camp, September 30th, October 1st and 2nd, the theme for that is um, the modern uh, eight gates. Okay, 
So we're going to be looking at the the Ninja no Hachimon, the, the that those traditional eight gates. What 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 does that look like in the 21st century? Not because I made it up. Based on the same idea of these things are necessary. This is the technology. This is what the past masters pointed to, right? Here are the skill sets. But what do those skill sets look like today? Right? That's hopefully I can fit it all into a weekend. And I haven't picked a theme for Daikomyosai, which is January 6th, 7th, and 8th, I think. It's the since the New Year's is a weekend. It's the second full weekend. I think I think that's what it works. Let me look at my calendar here quickly. Dun, 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 dun. Do I have that right, James? James keeps me straight. Yep, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Um, because the first falls on a Sunday. So I guess it's the first full weekend in January, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Okay. My birthday's the eighth, so I expect presents. <laughs> Uh, not P R E S E N T S presence, right? Your presence at the seminar for training. Uh, Mr. Francis, thank you for doing these. Great to hear your take on a lot of this. Oh, you're welcome. And lots of people are going to say I'm wrong. And I don't care because <laughs> I've done my research <laughs> and I was doing this art before some of them were even out of diapers, let alone being born. I know that makes me sound like an old man, but here we are, right? And you know what? There's a lot of people out there in the Bujin Khan as well making shit up, okay? They don't understand it as, any more than anybody else does, okay? So, um, all right, what else? Uh, I think that's it there. Anybody else? We've had people on, off. We can always tell when I've rubbed somebody the wrong way, right? Because the numbers drop and then other people come back on or whatever. And who knows? A couple of them, it could have been a technology thing and they signed back on or whatever. But uh, yeah. I, lo <laughs> I love when some of the people that uh, that are, are uh, I mean, everybody's skilled, right? But if you're going to present a skill... Like, I don't know, like an arcane weapon, like the like the shoge, right? The Kyoketsu Shoge, right? Um, and and you're gonna name your YouTube video that uh, here's some uses for it, but all it turns out to be is something that's like exercise because um, you were just gonna spin it around a whole lot or or whatever, then uh, maybe there's a problem. Okay. I my my first lessons with the weapons, right? The different weapon categories and all that is that all the classical weapons were models for modern things. One of the first assignments I got in this art was how to look at anything in a classical toolbox and learn how to equate that or figure out how to equate that to the stuff I'm going to find laying around. Because what are, what are the chances you're going to find a katana laying, laying along the the sidewalk, right? In the, in the place you got jumped or a long staff or a shoge, right? Uh, this hook, knife, dagger kind of thing, 15 to 18 feet of rope and a, and a weighted ring on the end. What are the chances? Okay. But what could you find? Okay. Instructions to uh, study uh, the mental things, not, not mind reading things that magicians do, but the mindset, right? Um, uh, sleight of hand and, and what that does, right, to mental wiring and stuff and misdirection, not necessarily sleight of hand, but misdirection, right? Um, uh, just studying different different things that, again, these in and of themselves. Am I, am I reconnected? I just got a, my connection broken, but I'm okay. Anyway, how much how much was missed? Oh, okay. So anyway, right? Um, apparently, I'm having connection issues. Am I still on? Okay, I th there might be a storm forming. So anyway, um, so we'll get through this. But um, just like that, but that senundo and enundo uh, drill that we talked about earlier, right? These things are not self-defense skills in and of themselves, but they have everything to do with self-protection or with producing the kind of results that we want to produce as ninja. 
right? Psychological warfare. It's not always just like, trying to destroy somebody, right? Somebody's trying to manipulate you. They're trying to take your job. They're trying to screw you over, right? A uh, family member trying to stab you in the back, whatever, right? If you understand the, the psychological warfare things of the, uh, the five needs and the five uh, weaknesses, right? Uh, all that changes, right? So, but I, I find that, that by and large, most people have just turned ninjutsu, what they're calling ninjutsu, into a martial arts option among other martial arts options. They turned it into a, into a style, okay? Ninjutsu is not a style, okay? Ninjutsu, first and foremost, is, is psychological warfare, information gathering, that kind of stuff. It's not... Because, uh, I mean, if, if it were the, all the fighting stuff that everybody wants to talk about, then they would seriously have to convince me that the lessons that were passed down um, were, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what they were. Like a ninja always draws his sword last. Uh, if a ninja draws his sword, he's already lost. Uh, doesn't have anything to do with sword, right? Um was the, one of the one of the last uh, things I do with my platinum guys. Uh, the lesson was about muto dori, which is normally con, um, uh, translated as, and it, I mean it's correctly translated as no blade catch, which is typically seen as unarmed against uh, a blade, sword. Right? He has a sword, I don't. Right? Uh, but there's been lots of lessons along the way from Hatsumi Sensei. Um, forget the sword. Right? It's not about the sword. It's against any array of weapons, but it's also used in unarmed as well. Okay. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, you know, if you're, if your mind is attached to getting cut, not getting cut, avoiding, not avoiding, whatever, right. You're going to get cut. Okay. Cause they're all traps, right. How do you do what you do? Okay. So if I'm not supposed to pay attention to the sword, what do I pay attention to? Expanding and diminishing space that's produced when the weapon travels through from its start point to you. That's what you're moving into. That's what I'm paying attention to. I'm paying attention to his intention to go. I'm, I'm paying attention to things that are not, they're, they're nothing like what most people think I'd be, I'd be paying attention to. But then it's the same thing in unarmed. Because once you learn weapons, that should be translated back to your unarmed as well. Right. Once you learn Muto Dori, your unarmed should be fucking amazing. Right. It has nothing to do with movement quality. It has to do with what you are paying attention to. It's all different. It's 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 completely different. All right. Anything else, James? Oh, the only other question. Says McLaren asked earlier. Doesn't all things evolve to fit the times, including our offer? Yes, of course. Everything. Oh, okay. Right. So, but I already answered it. Yeah. So um, it does evolve, but it's not the same as just doing whatever you want. Because there's a core set of principles and concepts that make needs to what it is. Right. That the, the, these natural laws that actually show up in other martial arts. Okay, they do show up in other martial arts. Okay, uh, I remember one of my teachers way back in the day spoke very, very highly of like Paul Vunak of Jeet Kune Do and Pauli Zink, who was a drunken monkey kung fu practitioner. Right, that their ability to use timing, distancing, angling, uh, the essential nature of a technique, and the control, and and all that kind of stuff. Right, just because the style or the type of taijutsu that they're using. Yes, that's the proper word, right? Looks different doesn't mean that their control of the situation is, is any different. Okay? As a matter of fact, when I was taught Taijutsu, right, it's important that you use the the the, the uh, modifiers, Budo Taijutsu, Nimpo Taijutsu, right? Because everybody that has an active activity has Taijutsu. Football players, American and soccer, right? have their taijutsu. People that have participated in different types of dance have their form of taijutsu. Ballet, whatever. Gymnasts have their form of taijutsu, 
right? Tajitu just means body skills, right? So, right, uh, soldiers, police officers that are entering a building, there's a certain type of Tajitu that's used, okay? Where I come in with the difference, right? And and if you if you get involved in that that eight gates program, right? Um, one of the modules, I think it's module three and four because Taijutsu was so big that we uh, extended it. It takes up two modules. Um, uh, we we may I, I define a very uh, I make a very uh, very specific distinction between Budo Taijutsu and Ninpo Taijutsu because we're defining the words, right? Budo, martial ways. So if Budo Taijutsu, right? Now we've got body skills for martial application. Ninpo, Ninpo is, is uh, laws or rules or methods for persevering, enduring, surviving. Surviving what? Okay. Same question that Hatsumi Sensei was asked by Takamatsu Sensei. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know all these martial arts. Great. But can you survive? Survive what? I don't know. Doesn't matter. Can you survive? Can you endure? Can you keep going? Right? So, again, we're back to that same thing that I had with the yanas within Buddhism, right? Ninpo Taijutsu includes the skill sets from Budo Taijutsu, but more. Okay, right? because most people that are studying Budo Taijutsu, I don't, I, I would, I, I would bet that 99.8% of them, I, I'd be willing to bet my baby's college fund. Most have not considered the type of Taijutsu or defense tactics they would have to have if a Rottweiler were trying to maul them. But it's still a self-protection situation. Okay, or somebody trying to hit him with a car. You get the idea, right? Okay, so Budo Taijutsu, that's the martial stuff that people want to focus on. And I can see why 70% or better of the people within the Bujinkan focus on Budo Taijutsu because that's their mental focus. Okay? But those of us who call it Ninpo Taijutsu, from my teachers in Japan, the Japanese teachers that I work with, right? Uh, and Hatsumi Sate has made very specific distinctions between Budo Taijutsu, Nippo Taijutsu, right? Nijutsu, Budo, that kind of thing, right? Um, one includes the other, but that's not necessarily true in the other direction, okay? James, are you signaling me for something? No? Okay. All right. So anyway, all right. Um, we've been going at this for a while, so um, uh, I, I think if there's no other questions or comments, We'll go ahead and wrap this up. Any, anything, James? I don't know how we're going to chat after the call, like or after the the show, like we usually do. Because um, anyway, you have to call me. Yo, dude, call me. <laughs> Talking to you cordless. Anyway, but well, that was an eighty statement, wasn't it? All right, so uh, that's it. So uh, hopefully, folks got some value out of this. Don't forget that uh, you can go onto the Kuden Podcast Facebook page and uh, submit questions or topic ideas or whatever, if you'd like me to speak on things. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I did that over last episode or two because my schedule of topics uh, kind of got bumped and I came back to this. Um, and, or you can uh, shoot me an email, right? Uh, to warrior C at warrior dash concepts dash online.com. And either James or I will get it. And uh, uh Everybody gets a everybody gets a reply back, even if it's you know even if it's something that I need to go into in great depth, right? You'll get a reply back, um, especially if it's something that's training related that you're working on right now, because I want you to have something that'll at least get you started, right? And then um, you know if it's something that I think is a big enough thing to go on as a as a topic on the show, then we'll absolutely do that. Um, or who knows if it's more technical. Right. As, as far as technique. Right. Uh, or tactic or strategic or whatever with with respect to um, uh, our, our physical skills. Right. Then I'll, I'll probably put it on like a whiteboard Wednesday. Right. So. Uh, 
I think that's it. All right, James, anything else? No? All right, guys, that's it then. I will talk to everybody again next week. Uh, same time, same bat channel, unless I'm dead, in which case James is going to do it um, or something. <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> All right. I think that's it. All right. So I'll talk to everybody again next time. Be safe, train hard, and uh, have a great rest of your week. See you guys. Get more of Kudan Radio. Subscribe to your favorite podcasting site or subscribe at ModernNinjaWarrior.com.